Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you for tuning in to this talk on issues in compiling and exploiting textbook corpora. I'm Ellen Lefau, and I'm a PhD candidate at Osnabrück University in Western Germany. In my talk today, I'm going to briefly talk about the potential of corpus-based textbook language studies before looking at practical issues related to the compilation and the exploitation of textbook corpora. If you'd like to download the slides, there's a QR code that you can scan to do just that. So why look at textbooks if we're interested in foreign language learning? Well, first, because textbooks in most countries are typically at the centre of the curriculum and syllabus. So they can really be said to be the main source of input that's presented to students in classroom EFL settings. And Thornbury adds that not only do they more often than not instantiate the curriculum, to a large extent, they also guide the methodology. So they can really be said to dominate and determine what's happening in the EFL classroom. In the Japanese context, Yukio Tono also highlights textbook language as a primary source of English language input in the classroom. And his paper from 2004, he argues that textbook English is a useful target corpus to use in the study of learner language. In a minute, I'll argue for a slightly different approach to students' target language. However, I entirely agree with Tono that in the context of instructed EFL learning, the study of textbook English is crucial to understanding learner English. Textbooks have long been a cherished object of study, but page-by-page -page analysis used to be a very laborious process. And it's changed thanks to the major advances in digital data storage and retrieval. The earliest textbook corpora that I'm aware of date back to the late 1980s and early 1990s. Magnus Jung converted the entire content of 56 EFL textbooks used in Sweden to machine-readable text. He lemmatized and extracted the most frequent 1,000 lemmas and then compared those to the most frequent lemmas in the co-build corpus. And around the same time in Germany, Dieter Mint developed an entirely corpus-driven grammar of future time expressions and later modal verbs. And he compared these empirical grammars to how these linguistic phenomena were represented in German EFL textbooks. And since a wide range of corpus-based textbook English studies have been conducted, but comparatively few have focused on school textbooks, more have been on textbooks used in adult education or in English for academic or specific purposes. And as I've tried to illustrate here, they focused on a broad range of lexical, grammatical, semantic and pragmatic features. But each study has focused on one or at most a handful of individual features. Let's now turn to the process of compiling a textbook corpus. It begins with the selection of the materials to be included in the corpus. That's a process that's driven by the research questions, because those will determine the design of the sampling frame. No matter how large, corpora nearly always represent only a sample of a target population. So the first step is to define that target population. For my textbook English corpus, I've decided that the target population is the English language content of all the textbooks from which all lower secondary school students in France, Germany and Spain were learning English as a second or foreign language between 2006 and 2018 before we look at ways to select which textbooks ought to be included in the sample, we need to first define textbook. And that's no mean task. Nowadays, modern publishers publish textbook packages, and these will include the students' books, the course books, but also maybe grammars, audio, video material, additional readings, websites and vocabulary apps, for instance, and there's a whole range of products that's targeted at teachers too. Depending on the country of interest, selecting textbook series for a corpus is more or less easy. In some countries, the textbook series are imposed by an educational authority. That's not the case in France, Germany or Spain, the three countries that I was interested in for my corpus. So that means it's necessary to find out which textbooks are most used. One way to do that, if possible, is to look at publisher sale figures. If these are not available, it might be possible to survey the publishers directly, or it may be necessary to ask some teachers and students. Another option 
is to ask large bookstores if they have sale information they're willing to share. Let's imagine that this pie chart represents the total number of secondary school students learning English and that each segment of the pie chart represents a textbook series that they're using. In this imaginary context, it's quite obvious that three textbook series dominate the market and then there are a number of other textbook series that are used by far fewer teachers in fewer classrooms. If um, given the situation, we were to take this chunk of the pie chart as our sample, we would find that our textbook corpus is not representative of the majority of textbook English that students are exposed to. So when creating a textbook corpus, we'll aim to select textbooks that a majority of students are actually using. But there are other considerations. We'll aim maybe to have a range of different publishers in our corpus. We may also consider different formats. So some textbooks are now entirely digital textbooks and this might have an impact on the language input that comes with these textbooks. Some textbook series and publishers have specific pedagogical approaches and here again we may want to have a range of those represented in our textbook corpus for balance. But in addition to these criteria that I've just mentioned, there are also opportunistic criteria. So for instance, are the textbooks already available in text format? That's rather rare, but may be possible if you have direct access to the textbooks from the publishers. Or in PDF format, which is already a very good format to work with. Or are the textbooks available in some other digital format um, that can be automatically converted to text. For instance, um, some textbooks are available as flash files to be used on smart boards. Or are the textbooks that you're looking at only available in print, in which case they will have to be manually scanned page by page and this will require human resources. Finally, financial resources are also a necessary constraint. I have found that some textbooks are available as PDFs from the publishers, but can only be bought as sets of 20 or 30 textbooks for an entire class. And at this stage, even if an individual PDF textbook is relatively cheap, a set of 20 or 30 does get rather expensive. Here's a textbook corpus that I came up with and that I'm using for my PhD project. It contains nine textbook series from three different countries. For each series, I have four to five textbook volumes. So that's 43 textbook volumes in total. Some of them I obtained as PDFs directly from the publishers, others in print and scanned, and uh, many I obtained as digital textbooks intended for use on smart boards, and these had to be converted to text. Once textbooks have been selected, the next step is usually conversion to raw text files. This can be quite a complex process in the case of textbooks because textbooks tend to have quite complex page layouts, different font types and colours, and might include the student's mother tongue in some of the instructions and explanations too. This means it might be necessary to have some form of an automatic cleanup process afterwards. So for instance, I had to write some scripts to remove special characters that the OCR software that I use included when it failed to recognize icons or certain font types. If you're getting students to compile their own textbook corpora, you might like to look into the use of Sarant, which is a software developed by Lawrence Anthony, is freely available and doesn't require any programming skills to remove such unwanted characters. A further step in corpus processing will be the inclusion of metadata. This is usually done in the form of markups. So for my textbook corpus, I just included a simple header at the start of each textbook volume, which encodes information that includes the name of the textbook series, textbook level, publisher, date of publication, the country of use. That very simple header that encodes the metadata enables me um, to look for specific subcorpora of my corpus. So I've uploaded my corpus onto Sketch Engine, as you can see here. And for instance, if I'm interested in searching for the word make, I can then select make in the textbook of specific publishers. Or I can limit my search to beginner textbooks, level A. 
I could choose specific textbook volumes or um, sort to specific publication years. In most cases, there'll also be a layer of automatic corpus annotation, things like part of speech tagging, lemmatization, or perhaps syntactic dependency parsing. The first two would be automatically done in something like Sketch Engine or can easily be done uh, using Ankong or Langsbox. What can then be done more specifically related to textbook corpora is another layer of manual corpus annotation. And here I'd like to introduce the Thema Corpus by Meunier and Gouverneur because they included a very interesting form of pedagogical tagging for the vocabulary exercise subcorpus of the Thema Corpus. This included more than 80 tags which tag the types of vocabulary learning activities and the status of the lexical items. So for instance, in an exercise that would look like this in a textbook, their coding would look something like this, meaning that every single term, every single um, gap is identified within the textbook corpus. And this enables some very fine-grained analysis of um, vocabulary learning in textbooks. For my own corpus, I decided to manually annotate text register. Why text register? Well, let's take a look at a modern school EFL textbook like this one. We find a number of individual texts and different text registers, even on a single double page. Here we have an informative text, another informative text, some instructions. Here is a listening activity, so we have some spoken interactions, a poem, explanations, and many other text types and text registers. So I decided to annotate these text registers within the textbooks manually and to help me do that I used um, something called Keyboard Maestro which means that if we have in a textbook say here um, an informative text and some instruction above and below it we can use the Keyboard Maestro to have shortcuts which automatically add some text and this text is the XML code that will later encode a text register. So here I can highlight the first set of instructions and type control I which is my custom shortcut which adds the code for instructional language. Here I've highlighted the informative text control F and then it adds the XML code for informative language and here again for the instructional language. So it's very quick, very efficient, reduces human error, but is very simple to implement and can be used by student annotators without um, requiring them to be trained in any specific software. So having added that extra layer of manual annotation, it means that I now have a number of subcorpora I can then look in more detail within one textbook or one textbook volume at, say, um, fictional writing within that textbook. Why is this interesting? Well, because it means I can think about target language learner in a slightly different way. If you think of what we want our students to be able to achieve at the end of secondary school, we really want them to be able to converse in English. Uh, we want them to be able to read for pleasure, to read novels, short stories in English, and we want them to be able to gain information and write informative texts themselves. That's why my target language reference corpus includes a subcorpus of conversation, and for that I use the Spoken BNC 2014, a custom-made corpus of youth fiction, so that's um, novels targeted at teenagers and young adults, and a corpus of informative websites for teens. And I can then compare, say, um, the spoken subcorpus of my textbook corpus with the BNC, um, the spoken BNC 2014. Or I can compare the fiction uh, writing in the textbooks to the reference corpus of youth fiction. We know that language varies greatly depending on register, and so for instance, when I compared the distribution of make meanings, it was important to really look at textbook fiction and compare that to the reference new fiction. And then I could see that phrasal verbs and delexical uses of make are underused in textbook fiction as compared 
to my reference U Fiction Corpus. Thanks to the detailed text register manual annotation, I was able to compare language variation across different school textbook registers using Biber's multidimensional analysis approach. Here are the results of an additive MDA. The textbook registers are plotted over here. And on Biber's first dimension, we can see that textbook conversation scores highest among the main textbook registers identified. However, if we compare the scores of textbook conversation with those of the spoken BSC 2014, we can see that the textbook conversation scores considerably lower than the naturally occurring conversation. We can look at differences across different textbook series and, and across the different proficiency levels of textbooks. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into any of the preliminary findings from the textbook English corpus, but if you're interested to find out more, for instance, on register variation within school EFL textbooks, you can have a look at this video that was recorded for the AKM41. Since my time is running out, I'll just leave this conclusion slide for you to study in your own time. Thank you for your attention today. I look forward to your comments, your questions and suggestions, either as part of the conference discussions or via email or on Twitter. Thank you.